Hey guys, uh, it's Dragons and Dragons here with uh, another episode playing D&D like a big old grown man. As you know, I've been breaking into the craft game and I'm on my next round of stuff for my modular stone kit for my sort of underworld. Um, I've done all my black paint on uh, several new pieces uh, as well as my my war banners and battle standards are uh, all painted up and done. Those are the guys in the front there. Nice focus. Oh yeah. As you know, I've been breaking into the craft game and I'm on my next round of stuff for my modular stone kit for my sort of underworld. Um, I've done all my black paint on uh, several new pieces uh, as well as my my war banners and battle standards are uh, all painted up and done. Those are the guys in the front there. Nice focus. Oh yeah. Next we're going to do the dry brushing and sponge painting. Um, my man Hev Pink over at Cult Moo said I should try doing a video where I explain a little more how I'm doing this stuff. I am a total noob. I don't know if you guys didn't catch it in the first video, but I have never done any of this craft stuff before. First time. So it feels a little weird to be uh, giving tips on how to do the, the painting techniques. Um, but hey, why not? We're gonna go right, woo. Let me come in a little closer here. Uh, we've got one mini for scale. And here we have like these sort of battle standards that I've done. And I like these painting techniques. I also have this spire is from the last round, the altar of sacrifice. So I have that here for reference so that I make sure to get all my stones consistent. Now here's, all my new pieces. So I have all my new pieces black painted um, and then we're gonna work through them. So I've got these caves which I'm gonna use for like bad guy spawners. I've got these which are uh, pieces to a gate system that I'm doing. Here's the gate itself. So everything is black. Everything's just about dry and uh, yeah so now we're gonna go into close-up crafty cam Cam man, and then we're going to get the old sponge out and get work done. A wall section. I think I'm gonna need some more paint. And one way to get a little more mileage out of your paint is to get a wide, big bunch of paint on your sponge, like, like how. Yeah. Start going for it. Sponge will eat up your paint. My gray forming. So this is another great thing about having a sloppy plate is once your color matches from a previous color, you'll see it just kind of feel like it's blending and making sense. So here's our wall piece. There's a bunch of paint right there. Nice. You know, don't be shy. You want it to be nice and bright. Too much black can be depressing. There's that one. So one great thing about doing these grays is it's way quicker than doing the blacks. When you're doing your blacks, you just need really good coverage and you gotta get in every nook and cranny. It takes forever. If you have a covered space and you don't live in the Northwest like I do, you could probably just use spray paint, do it outside and get it done in a quarter of the time. But uh, we have rain all the time and it's not make for good spray paint weather. So here you go. Altar of Sacrifice, I did a pretty small base. It's about nine by nine. Uh, this big guy is more like about 22 by 16 or something more like that. Pretty large. So. Mixing up paint, making this same gray. And just like before, get the color to match up. Another technique you can use when you're doing a really big area like this, let me come around. 
um, is just paint paint your paint right onto your sponge like that and you can get lots of paint on your sponge See that? Tons of paint on the sponge. Put that back there. Here's your sponge and then just get started. Remember, you don't want to, to rub. You just want to dab. Just get a whole sponge full of paint. Do a little bit of wrap around on the corners. Remember too, this is your dim, your dim gray color. So more coverage is okay. You're gonna be really gentle with your next color, which is the brighter gray. But here, like lots of this dimmer gray is, is perfectly fine. You can squeeze the sponge into some of the cavities. And you are going to chow through paint, you will notice very quickly that you're just gonna eat paint. Paint, delicious but deadly. Very nice. Now, I haven't really mentioned it in any of the videos, but um, you'll notice that my grid is appearing as I paint. Uh, that's because I just took a Zacto knife and just freehanded a grid, very shallow cut into the polystyrene. Um, just drew a grid freehand, just went for it. Didn't measure inches, didn't do any of that stuff. If you're a real stickler, then, you know, feel free, but I'm not really that way. Um, and then I just took the, the Zacto and I just freehanded a big spiral with one line. And that just kind of gives it a little bit of a mythic feel, but also it'll break that grid. I, I found that, um, I did one of these that I threw away that I didn't like where the grid was just too precise and too controlled and it just didn't have a feeling of, of like fun to it. I, I might be esoteric but you know and then you probably saw in my previous video I take a dice usually a d6 or a d8 and you push the dice anywhere that a line crosses you push the corner of the dice in and you'll get this kind of realistic uh, corner, corner wear. Okay, so there I'm done with my, my doom gray color. Using a big, thick hunk of polystyrene like this, it lifts it off the table, and it gives this feeling of like, more of a little bit of a board game feeling. I know that some people don't like D&D &D to become uh, a board game feeling experience, but uh, you know, I'm a fan. I like that kind of feel to things. Okay, so if you get a couple spots where the paint gets a little heavy, you can see I've got two spots right here where the paint got heavy. Got your second uh, sponge over here. Take your second sponge, which you have in reserve, because you're awesome. There's your second sponge, and it's still clean. And then go in and just do that. And what it'll do is it'll texture that paint. So you're not gonna be pulling that paint off of there, but by using a clean sponge, you can give it a lot of texture, and that way it won't catch light in a dumb way, and it'll still look like a stony, kind of expanse. Keep all your brushes and your sponges in a Ziploc. That way you never have to wash and dry all your brushes, which I don't know if you're like me, but I find that terribly annoying. Let's take a look at one of these other pieces for comparison. So there you go, that's, that's where we're headed. Okay, so next up, we are going to do um, bright gray. So we'll go back to the other stuff for the small pieces for that. Okay, uh, level one of the, the sort of dim gray color is pretty much dry. So we're gonna go on to the next round of sponge paint and dry brush paint, which will do our next highlight up so that we can match our piece of reference stone here, which has some brighter highlights on it. So we're gonna zoom in here. Here's the gray we were working with before. I'm gonna add plenty of white. go, there's our white, and I don't want to get too white uh, just because I'm trying to match the stone from the altar of sacrifice. So we'll get a little blurp of black in there. This brush should work fine. And let's get a, there you go, see how that's a 
several tones brighter than what we were painting before. Keep that nearby. And I'm just gonna take my brush here with my, I got my nice clean sponge on deck and I'm gonna start priming my sponge with this paint. See that? So now you get plenty of, plenty of paint on your sponge and keep it nice and even. Uh, for the, the highlight step, you're gonna wanna be a lot more gentle and a lot more controlled. So you wanna do just a couple of key moves with your sponge. So if you can see here, Just do one of those, there you go. And then start rounding off your highlights. As a general rule, you wanna go a little more aggressive on the tops of things than on the bottom and you'll get this sort of false sense of lighting. Here's our next one. So my, my first sponge there was a little heavy on paint, but now this second one, this is perfect. Getting that look. Um, let's see. Right, I'm getting, I'm running a little low on paint now. But I'm gonna try to keep squeezing life out of it. It's interesting to try to stay on camera here while you're being aesthetic with this. So sometimes I'll just get a nice little chunk of paint just like that, right on the corner of my sponge, and just go right where I know I want a strong highlight. Now I'm not quite getting as much white as I might like, so sometimes I'll just keep a little white off to the side and just intentionally just get white and kind of do these little guys. See that? Just a little bit of white, a little bit of white. Uh, where you get some of those hot corners. So, there you go. I'm just gonna proceed doing that all around now. little spikes on my door are painted with silver um, but the silver is not really giving me enough pop so I'm gonna make a new color here I don't know if you can see I'm right over where's my finger at right there making a new color okay and I'm gonna finish up some highlights and we're gonna charge our camera battery get this sort of really bright silver color I don't know if you can yeah you can see that so it's mostly white with just a touch of silver. Paint most of it out of your brush and then I'm just gonna get the tops of these. Again, I'm using barely, barely any paint. But there, now when you look at it from the top down, your spikes pop out quite a bit more. It's Drunkins and Dragons. And I am looking at the DMG 5th edition and wondering why there are so few random encounter tables for the Underdark. And that's what we're doing. Good time to have a mustache. And um, then we have, you know, stuff like this where you've got gates that you can move up and down, caves for things to come out of. This is like our mystery cube. Uh, we made some banners, and the banners can be used to represent different area buffs. Totally normal stuff that other people invented. I'm a noob. Let's make sure that this is out in the open. I'm brand new at doing this. But I gotta say, after the first night of playing, this is way better than the under-illuminated map. 
which was my second video. So if you made an underlit glass table and spent like your life savings on it because of that video, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I made you do that, but this is better. The lines of sight are really intuitive. The feeling of hell yeah is awesome. We also did a great thing. We started the campaign with the, the guys being prisoners and so they had to break out of their manacles and they have no gear. True level one stuff. Getting the beat down. So anyways, thanks for joining us. Um, you know, every time we try to film a group of five people playing D&D all night and drinking beer, it just makes for horrible, horrible footage. So you will not be seeing anything. <laughs> and that's okay. We're going to keep working on how to play D&D, not footage of playing D. So, of, yeah, you, you know it. Footage of playing D&D, footage of playing D&D. Dungeons and Dragons, footage of playing it is not what you're going to see on this channel. You're going to see all the other stuff. Look at that. That is crazy in there. PC recap. The new group consists of Florian the Florist, Lord of the Tower, Master of the Watch. And Florian has been awesome. He is our elven cleric tank who is lawful good. And so anytime that things aren't moving, he gets them moving with his obnoxious behavior. But you know, he treats people really nicely. And he's a nice person. And being a nice person is important. Especially when you're a cleric. So we're gonna be together until I finish this. Then we also have Milo Underbottom and his brother Erich Underbottom. Long ago, there was a hill called Bottom. And there were those halflings who lived atop it and those who lived beneath. These two brothers are haunted by a letter they received from their deceased brother concerning an arcane mystery, which sounds conveniently relevant to our Underdark adventure. And finally, Twigs, the druid. A druid who'd rather wield a battle axe than a quarter staff, if you ask me. A wolf, sheep's clothing. We've also been using gold coins like these for inspiration. So I'm like, bang, 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 inspiration. What? Yes, that is happening. You have advantage on your next saving throw, baby, because I'm gonna go. Oh, it's so good to have a PVE group together. Oh, man. Now, I think we tried to film something at the beginning. You know, we rolled a few characters. Uh, did we film anything? Damn! So you could kill a kobold and get a fourth level spell scroll. And they're like, let's sell this. And I'm like, you're in the Underdark. If you're rolling like crap, is it your D20's fault? Can you switch out the D20 and start rolling good. Is it real? I know there's probably some kind of math physics garbage that has the actual truth, but I'm not interested. I want to know about experiences. If you're rolling like crap all night long, like you, you're rolling twos and sixes, does switching out the D20 change your luck? It Does the D20 play a role in how good you roll? Cooper, did you hear that? Coon? Cooper. My dog's appreciation of dice humor is just so minimal. That's the end.